At the turn of the 20th century, New York City was experiencing many changes. There was an influx of immigrants arriving to the city from all over the world. Many immigrants were from Europe. While some immigrants spread out and settled across the United States, many stayed close to the shadow Lady Liberty. The new arrivals settled across the five boroughs in New York City, Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, Staten Island, and Manhattan Island. By January 1st, 1898, when the boroughs of New York consolidated, New York City had an area of 360 square miles and a population of 3.5 million people. The 20th century was an era of great struggle for American cities as a result of rapid growth. New York City was no exception. During this time, thousands of immigrants settled in Manhattan's Lower East Side where they found themselves living in buildings called tenements. The tenements were very crowded and unsanitary. Indoor plumbing was non-existent and disease spread through the neighborhoods very quickly. By the mid-1920s, there were opposing viewpoints on how a city should develop to accommodate population growth. One such viewpoint came from the master builder, Robert Moses, who forcefully advocated a futuristic vision for the city. He viewed the city as a scorch that had to be dealt with. Considered a progress, he took on the challenge of modernizing an old, cluttered city. Moses' futuristic vision included replacing the slums and seeming chaos of people crowding the streets by a clean, orderly system of sheets and large housing projects. Bridges would be added to not only connect four of the boroughs together, but also to allow for travel beyond the city limits. While Moses' vision brought order and efficiency to a chaotic city, it unfortunately disrupted many of the unique social aspects of city life. Robert Moses would be often met with resistance as he planned a project. Rather than taking in the perspective of those who protest, Moses focused on the outcome of the project and did not care if it demolished neighborhoods. Moses was a very powerful figure in New York City from 1924 to 1975. While he was never elected to an office, he was able to secure a dozen job titles that gave him the freedom to push a project forward without much red tape. Throughout his career, he was a president or chairman of one group or another, the Parks Commission, the Planning Commission, and the Public Works, Power 30, and even the World's Fair. Moses was very controversial, in part because he was a bully. He hacked his way through projects as if with a meat axe. At the same time, one can't argue against the accomplishment of completing the sheer number of large-scale projects that he did. By 1940, Robert Moses led the transformation in New York City. He oversaw the construction of 13 bridges, 2 tunnels, 637 miles of highway, 658 playgrounds, 10 giant swimming pools, and 17 state parks. He even oversaw the building of Lincoln Center, the United Nations, Shea Stadium in Queens, Jones Beach, the Central Park Zoo, Triborough Bridge, and Verrazano Narrow Bridges. Moses was able to secure funding after the Great Depression through the New Deal, WPA, and local toll money. The construction of interstate highways and suburbs after World War II made it easier for rich people to leave the city. This along with deindustrialization, led to an exodus out of the city and white flight. In fact, a big tragedy, and intentional one, was the way Moses used his influence to play out his discriminatory practices. He was, was anti-mass transit. He did not care to revamp the aging subway system. Instead, he focused on what white population with their cars could access. Jones Beach, for example, was deliberately designed as a state park about 40 minutes from the city limit, which could only be reached only by a car, not even by a bus. Moses constructed low clearance bridges on the route so that, by his measure, brown and black people who traveled primarily by bus would not be able to get to Jones Beach. Moses also supported the outright discrimination of Stuyvesant Town, an 89 building apartment complex that meant to ease the housing crisis after World War II. The idea was to provide veterans affordable, clean housing in a historical part of the Lower East Side of New York City.
He was ruthless in his quest to clear out the slums and its people. In 1945, New York Times called the move from the site the greatest and most significant mass movement of families in New York's history because 11,000 people were displaced from the site in order to build Stuyvesant Town. There was little, if any, community input. In addition, once the project was complete, black veterans were banned from renting at Stuyvesant Town. While anti-discrimination lawsuits were filed, the discriminatory practice continued on a basis that the project was a public-private collaboration. In 1956, there seemed to be nothing that could stop Robert Moses from pushing his urban renewal agenda. However, he had encountered on meeting a certain writer by the name of Jane Jacobs. The Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956 set aside funding for a national system of highways. Moses had a plan for that money. He was looking for a way to get lower Manhattan traffic to move into and out of the city quickly and connect New Jersey to Long Island. He came up with the plan for the Lower Manhattan Expressway, or LOMEX. The design called for an elevated superhighway with 10 wide lanes that would soar above the city streets. The pillars supporting the highway would disrupt the neighborhoods below, or 2,000 families would be displaced and 400 buildings would be demolished. Washington Square Park would be impacted by this. Jane Jacobs, a resident and keen observer of city life, would be directly affected by LOMEX. Jacobs had a very strong belief system about cities. Where others saw chaos, she saw beauty of people interacting with each other, shopping where they lived and being able to walk from place to place. Crowds on the sidewalks meant eyes on the street. She noticed that people felt safer in streets with more people. She argued that being close to parks and unique landmarks offered its residents a high quality of life. Urban developers at the time felt that the high rise called the projects would provide the same, but they were wrong. Upon learning that Washington Square Park was being threatened by Moses' proposed development, she and a large group of citizens organized to oppose the project. People's passions were put to work doing legal research, translating documents into Spanish, and in Jacob's case, writing letters to the mayor and leading protests. Eventually, the community won and defeated Moses, this was because Jane Jacobs wouldn't take no for an answer. It's how the people are interweaving in this tapestry of life. That's what's important. Presently, over 153,000 cars travel over the Brooklyn Queens Expressway every day. The expressway is in danger of collapse if it is not fixed soon. A New York Times article titled Brooklyn Heights is Fighting Robert Moses Again from 2018 says it best. In terms of its built environment, New York now contains two cities in conflict. One is the gleaming 21st metropolis of Bloomberg administration imagination. The other is the deteriorating landscape onto which it was almost mindlessly grafted once guarded so many places by the blind ambitions of Robert Moses. During his 51-year turn as an urban developer in New York City, Robert Moses transformed New York City in a very forceful manner. With the sheer number of changes was a triumph, the modernization of New York City tragically community perspective and input as exemplified by the protest of J.J. Jacobs was ignored. This exclusion of perspective erode the cultural and unique in neighborhoods that once existed in New York City. In Jane Jacobs' book called The Death and Life of Great American Cities, she received praise for helping people view the city as an ecologist might study a delicate and complex natural environment, a system where changes must be made gradually and carefully.